All right, we're looking at some big moves post Fed cut. 30 minutes until the start of cash trading. I'm Matt Miller. And I'm Shanali Bassett. Katie Greifeld is off today, and Bloomberg Open Interest starts right now. Coming up, the Fed's power move ripples through markets as bets for more cuts ramp up. Next up, it's the Bank of Japan's turn. And with less than seven weeks until the election, the Fed has reframed the debate about the economy. We've got the latest from the campaign trail, plus global Wall Street reacts. We'll hear from BlackRock's Jean Vauvin, RBC's Amy Wu Silverman, and renowned investor Steve Eisman. First off, let's take a look at where the market is trading. And it may blow your mind if you're just waking up because we have futures gaining 1.5% on the S&P, more than 2% on the NASDAQ. This after we retreated during yesterday's session. So it looks like investors have had a chance to digest this move and thought, no, they got a lot more cutting to come, Shanali. Is it possible that we get another 50 basis point move in November? Well, the bond market might not be saying so. Six basis points on the 10-year. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Some stocks to watch before the market opens. Keeping an eye on NVIDIA today, the world's third largest company, jumps in pre-market trading and by a significant amount, 3.2% nearly. Mobileye jumping 7.4%. Intel says it does not have plans to divest its 88% stake in the autonomous driving company. And Darden Restaurants reported sales that missed estimates but showed improvements after July. Consumers are spending. You see Darden up 8% pre-market. Investors are also applauding a partnership with Uber to deliver from brands like Olive Garden and Longhorn Steakhouse Unlimited Breadsticks at home, Matt. Oh, that sounds lovely. At the end of an era um, for, I guess, a four-year era for rates, the Fed pivots, but no commitments for further cuts this year. A broad set of indicators suggest that conditions in the labor market are now less tight than just before the pandemic in 2019. The labor market is not a source of elevated in inflationary pressures. I do not think that, that anyone should look at this and say, oh, this is the new pace. You have to, have to think about it in terms of the base case, of course, what happens will happen. If the labor market were to slow unexpectedly, then we have the ability to react to that. We have greater confidence now that inflation is moving down to 2%, but at the same time, our, our plan is that we will be at 2%. All right, so he, you know, um, seemed to be downplaying what's to come, uh, as well as the dot plot kind of downplayed that. We'll touch on that when we get to Mike McKee. But I noticed that Michael Ferroli over at J.P. Morgan, who was the only big bank Fed forecaster who got it right, said we could have another 50 basis point move in November if the labor market is weak enough. If, and what's interesting is it so far is not showing that. We'll talk more about that in a minute. It, you can see how much the bond market was a little overbought here because you're seeing the two-year and 10-year rising and that steepening just taking off a 12 basis point differential at this point in time. You're seeing the 10-year yield move almost six basis points higher this morning after a 50 basis point cut. So that tells you a little bit about how and it's all there, market. because if you look over the last three days, the 10 year is actually up about 12 basis points. So I guess that's where the steepening is coming from. It's more of a bear steepening. Joining us now is Michael McKee, Bloomberg's chief international economics and policy correspondent. Mike, we're back to watching the data. As Shanali points out, the labor market data that we got today, we get, you know, um, uh, claims didn't show anything interesting, but Michael Ferroli says if we get, you know, 100,000 or less in uh, the September number, the Fed could be off to the races again. Yeah, these numbers don't tell you anything about what we're going to get when we get to the uh, September jobs numbers, but this was the survey week for the jobs numbers, and we saw the jobless claims fall to two, uh, 219,000 from 231,000. We just keep going down. Now, that may be somewhat affected by seasonals, but it's still a very low number. We're stuck in a range there. The other number out today, though, that may be influencing a little bit that 10-year yield, the Philadelphia Fed, uh, comes in at 1.7, a big jump from negative 7. But look at what prices paid did. Rose 10 points, uh, and just about every 
sector in the Philadelphia index reported higher input prices. So something to keep an eye on is inflation down the road. Now, the Fed is going to try to follow its plans for uh, 25 basis point cuts at the next two meetings, but they are aggressively starting to cut now. By the end of next year, the new dot plot says 3.4%. Uh, will be the final. And you can see uh, how we've shifted down there from uh, where we were. That's the terminal rate. And the terminal rate moved up to 2.9. So that's the question of whether they think that is actually neutral. And I think what you'll see is that um, these numbers, these dots float around a lot over the next year because uh, we have so much going on out there that could really change things. We'll be watching borrowing costs, of course, to see what happens. And we've already seen prime rates come down, mortgage rates and auto rates came down into the meeting as people anticipated what the Fed was going to do. So the real question for consumers is those really tall lines there, those are the credit card average rates. And you can see they're much higher and they are stickier. But let's see if they come down with any kind of dispatch that might lead consumers to spend more. And then the Fed has to worry about a little bit inflation. You've got to pay off those statements every month, Chanel. You can't let it slide. Oh, I've been letting it slide for years. It's <laughs> ob obviously, Matt. Uh, there's also going to be lower savings rates pretty soon, too, I'm sure, too. So that should move some money. Michael McKee, we thank you so very much. We are joined by Jean Bovan, head of the BlackRock Investment Institute. And you think about that first cut, that large cut, and the expectations moving forward, the uncertainty ahead. How do you think the calculus has changed for investors after yesterday? Well, I think I think uh, the market uh, reaction, and as you see since yesterday, is uh, is trying to figure that out uh, as we speak. I think, um, and I think it reflects, in our view, uh, you know, some mixed messages that have been um, coming through yesterday. Um, we would love to see uh, to think that there's an all clear now, and we have clarity on what's coming next. But I think the reality is very different. Uh, mixed messages because uh, on the one hand we had a big 50 basis points cut. Um, but on the other, we had to get a characterization that the economy is solid, uh, the risks are balanced, and the Fed, they think, is, are not beyond the curve. So that this is one of these things that doesn't seem to be uh, to be aligning here. Uh, mixed messaging because uh, we're talking about recalibration, which um, has a meaning that, that, you know, it's not autopilot and so on. At the same time, uh, they're, they're signaling very aggressive cuts from here, as we were just discussing. So I think the mixed messages mean that, like, as, uh, as we go, uh, we're going to start looking back at this uh, meeting and maybe uh, interpret what was said differently. So I think I don't think we're mm -hmm. done here. Well, it's interesting. You see the jobless claims data coming in this morning and showing some promising signs in the labor market. You also see it in earnings, at least for this morning. Interesting to hear Darden Restaurant saying that after July, traffic really started to improve. Didn't you also think about the idea here that a 50 basis point cut by the Fed would also start to impact savings rates that you might get at a bank, particularly ones that have been offering such high rates to consumers to begin with? How much money can move and where does it go to? Yeah, so I think uh, uh, we're at the beginning, right? So I, I think uh, 50 is a big uh, one-day move, but at the same time, um, uh, we'll, I, we don't believe we're going to see the easing uh, the expectation that we're currently seeing. So, uh, I, and since these rates that people are paying are getting in their savings accounts are sticky, um, I'm not sure that that's going to lead to big flows just yet. Uh, so I would, I would, my 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 starting point would be that uh, this would be a uh, this would be a um, you know uh, marginal for now. Uh, the, ch the shift in savings versus consumption. Uh, what is more uh, at play right now is I think the consumption is still very solid. I mean, the economy is, um, you know, th this quarter will be a, will be a robust quarter. And, um, and, and that's going to raise questions about like what really is happening here. It's very unusual. This is a, a very unusual circumstance. We have e financial conditions that have been easing. Uh, continue to ease as as uh, as monetary policy was at peak tightness supposedly. Um, so this very unusual situation, I don't think is reflected uh, in the messaging we've seen and in the kind of certainty there is on an easing cycle that has started. You know, uh, we are looking for the whisper number for the September jobs report that comes out on October 4th is 132,000. And the concern is, especially since revisions keep pointing down, um, that we're going to be bouncing around the 100,000 mark, maybe even lower. Are you not at all worried about this labor market, John? 
Well, I think, uh, uh, yeah, I mean, we were, there's a lot of question marks uh, and we'll look at the data that's going to come and the whisper number you're mentioning very carefully. But I, I do think that the um, how we evaluate, assess this labor market is, is also very unusual. Uh, uh, we had a very unusual immigration effect on the labor market that, uh, you know, as uh, distorts how you would think about the unemployment rate, um, I think has allowed the run rate of payroll to be sustained at a much higher pace than you would have thought normal before. Uh, and if we recalibrate back, back to something that is more around 100,000 sustained, but 100,000, uh, that might be in line with the slowdown we need uh, to cool uh, to cool this economy. So before we get worried, I think we would need to see uh, not only like 130,000 jobs, but like uh, worry that this could break from there downward. And I don't see that. Uh, I guess the jobless claim today, one data point, but um, I don't see that uh, still uh, being the, the baseline. What, what's your, um, how do you see the immigration effect on labor? I know that Mickey Bowman, who was the sole dissent yesterday, has said in the past that if you restrict immigration, it could tighten the um, labor market, reducing the pool, and indeed, it looks like the Biden administration, in an attempt to sway voters heading towards November, has finally done something on that. Um, do we get a tighter labor market if you get fewer people coming um, across the borders? Yeah, well, I, th I think it's important to, uh, in our view at least, to re we think like the last two years, well, I saw a huge inflow in the labor market that was actually a surprise for everyone, uh, even for the, the statistics, right? I mean, they were missed for, for some time. Um, that has helped to uh, imagine what would uh, the labor market look like without this massive info. We're talking about millions of, uh, of workers. Uh, I think wage pressures would be very different. Uh, the, we would not have been able to sustain like the 200,000 job uh, numbers we've seen earlier this year and so on. Uh, as we go into 2025, we don't think that we're going to be able to sustain the same, um, the same uh, you know, uh, surprising level of immigration. And it's true no matter the outcome of the election, because I think on both sides, we're going to see uh, a tighter kind of uh, approach to, uh, to immigration. And it's not only in the U.S., I think it's in many countries. Uh, so, yeah, I don't think we can assume that the labor market uh, that has benefited from, uh, you know, a, a safety valve, if you will, to, uh, to the distance of workers will, will, will still be able to uh, depend on that. So I think it's a tighter market story. Uh, could lead to wage pressure that nobody's clearly expecting at this point. And so, yeah, I think this is a big, uh, a big story to follow. All right, Jean, thanks so much for joining us. Jean Bovan there of the BlackRock Investment Institute talking to us a day after the first rate cut in four years and a 50 basis point move um, that has spurred massive moves in futures. You can see S&P futures up one and two thirds percent, NASDAQ futures up two and a quarter percent, and uh, the Russell 2000, of course, doing the best of the group. Shanali, I think it's especially interesting because yesterday, of course, after we got this decision, the market had hours to digest what had happened and sold off at the end of the day. We have new data now also, right? We have those jobless claims coming in lower than expected, signaling maybe that soft landing narrative. He didn't say it explicitly. I would also point out here, the people that were worried about that carry trade, it is not unwinding more for now. People were worried here that a further differential between the U.S. and Japanese rate here would create more issues, but that is not the case today. And you see the yen having extending its drop as well. Yeah, the yen right now trading at 143.42. I mean, it's pretty strong if you got in the carry trade at 150 or 160, you know. Um, in any case, we'll continue to watch that. Believe me, we'll continue to pay close attention to the carry trade and some of the individual names moving ahead of the opening bell. For that, we go over to Abigail Doolittle. Abby, what do you got? Well, rising tide certainly lifts all stocks, but for idiosyncratic reasons, we do have the shares of PayPal rising up more than 2% this after they marked a deal, inked a new deal with Amazon by uh, with Prime. So essentially, with certain uh, prime deals, you will be able to use your PayPal account. Mizuho is saying this is a big positive, considering that they also have partnerships with Fiserv and Adian. And he uh, rate continues to maintain his outperform rating and a $90 price target, suggesting that there could be some pretty, pretty big uh, potential upside from here. Turning to the travel trade, this is probably more about the risk rally we're seeing after the Fed cut rates by 50 basis points. American Airlines up 2.5%, Carnival up 2.5%. 7%, although we did have J.P. Morgan out bullish on the cruise line stocks, uh, cruise operator stocks this 
week. And then Hilton up 1.4 percent. Goldman initiated on both Hilton and Marriott yesterday uh, with a buy rating. So that strength continuing. And then finally, Apple, after a rough start this week on reports of a weaker uptake for that iPhone 16, today up 2.1 percent after rising 2 percent over the last two days. Shanali, it really does feel as though there's a little bit of a risk rally happening. One big question, though, will it last? Out of bonds into equities. Abigail Doolittle, we thank you so very much for keeping an eye on all that's moving. Now, coming up, tapping into Oprah's star power. Vice President Kamala Harris will hold a live stream town hall with Oprah Winfrey in hopes of mobilizing swing state voters. We're going to have the latest on the race for the White House next. This is Bloomberg. Let's get now to high interest and look at what's making headlines around the world. TD Bank said its CEO, Basrat Masrani, will retire in April as the bank grapples with investigations by the Department of Justice and financial regulators. The probe is into lapses in money laundering controls, alleged lapses in money laundering controls at the Canadian bank's U.S. branches. Masrani says he takes full responsibility for the bank's anti-money laundering challenges. Meanwhile, Apple has been warned by the EU to open up its highly guarded iPhone and iPad operating systems to rival technologies or it risks significant fines under the bloc's flagship digital antitrust rules. The announcement isn't quite an investigation, but it signals that the EU intends to compel Apple to re-engineer its services to raise competition. The company has six months to comply. And Democrats are hoping Oprah Winfrey's influence and popularity is going to send voters into a frenzy for Kamala Harris, or at least help her win by a couple of points. The billionaire media icon will join the Democratic presidential candidate into a, in a live streamed town hall in Michigan later on today. Shanali? And let's stay on politics because Kamala Harris is leading Donald Trump 50 to 46 percent in Pennsylvania, according to the latest New York Times Siena poll. And this also comes as the International Brotherhood of Teamsters declined to endorse either of these candidates. The Teamsters general president said in a statement, unfortunately, neither major candidate was able to make serious commitments to our union to ensure the interests of working people are always put before big business. Joining us now as Bloomberg's Big Take podcast host, David Gura. You know, how significant is this and how does it kind of sway the fields here, especially when you think of what Matt has been saying, Kamala Harris has traditionally been more aligned with the left when she was uh, prior voting as a member of the Senate, correct? 320 so, votes. She had the most liberal voting record of any senator except for Elizabeth Warren and Bernie very Sanders. Long stint, noted. <laughs> yeah, true. Yeah. Both yeah. things noted. Um, this is a huge union, the largest in the country, so 1.3 million people, and they um, have endorsed candidates historically. The last time they endorsed Republican was back in 1988. So suffice to say, both of these candidates wanted that endorsement. Didn't happen this time around, and I think it's because of some missteps on the candidates' parts, uh, and also just because of the reinvention that we've seen of this campaign over these last few months. You know, Joe Biden is somebody who's very proudly aligned himself with unions. Um, Vice President Harris wasn't able to make that connection the same way as he. Um, we'll see what happens here. We, you know, local branches of this union have been encouraged to endorse candidates as they want, and over these last few hours, some have aligned themselves with uh, the former president, some with Vice President Harris. So that's percolating and continuing as, as we go along. We see, obviously, they're on both sides of the aisle, big populist plays here. They're trying to buy votes or at least use campaign promises to convince voters that they'll be better off um, in tax terms, right? And Donald Trump was in Long Island yesterday uh, continuing to push his um, salt claims that he would remove that cap, even though he's the one that put the cap on. Um, it's some amazing sophistry here. Yes, back in 2017, he put that cap on when the Trump tax cuts made their way through through Congress. So he's saying now, were he to be elected, he would eliminate that. Of course, he would need Congress to do that. But you're right, over the course of this campaign, both candidates have been doing this, but he most extremely, when it comes to tax policy, has been going to various locations, kind of identifying what the needs, the economic needs of, of potential constituents might be. In Nevada, in Las Vegas, it's tips came out with that policy not to tax tips. Uh, we've seen it with Social Security, et cetera. So yeah, overtime, overtime. And, and we've seen Kamala Harris adopt some of that in her platform as well. But you're right, there's no, there's no 
meat backing that up, and so you look at just restoring the, you know, the, the salt deduction, we're talking about a trillion dollars in, in cost, and there's really no do point know, to do with that. You know, what's interesting, the whole, the reason yeah. um, that over time uh, was legislated as time and a half is because at the time, Congress thought, well, if you're working overtime, you're taking another job, right? Okay. And, and now, you want to eliminate taxes there. But, I guess you're not interested you, in that. I won't, you know, this is what I want to know, because so this came up yesterday in our conversation yeah. with Bess Friedman, who's big in the real estate world in New York and Florida, and the point she was making on SALT was that this is appeasing kind of wealthier donors in the New York area, whereas a lot of these other tax policies are more aimed at the middle and lower class. Yeah? For sure. And look, there are Democrats who would really welcome this as well in this kind of greater metropolitan area, and I think what we heard from Donald Trump last night was... Um, a brazen claim that he thinks that Republicans can win New York. I'm not convinced that that can happen, but there are kind of a handful of Republican seats in the House that he's trying to keep. He's looking down ballot, and I think that this could be effective in trying to get some of them saving their seats. Yeah, I mean, wealthy is relative, right? I mean, we have a story on the terminal about a doctor making $350,000 who can't find a house he can afford in Long Island. So it's different uh, making that money here than it is making it in my hometown, Granville, Ohio. Obviously, it's much a easier. House anywhere around True. here. True, and yeah. I think that's what you're saying, which is like yeah. candidate looking for kind of niche opportunities here to go after these swing state voters or voters who could go either way. David, awesome to have you on the show. Great to be here. Love your podcast. Thank you. David Gura is the host of the Big Take podcast. Check it out on uh, Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. Coming up, Microsoft is going back to the drawing board to improve combat. Uh, Combat goggles for the U.S. Army. That's what these are, goggles. Details in Social Climbers next. This is Bloomberg. And it's time now for Social Climbers. The company is making waves this morning. And first up is Cracker Barrel, burning biscuits and not the buttermilk kind. The rustic-themed restaurant chain reported fourth quarter earnings that fell short of estimates. Cracker Barrel has struggled as inflation-weary customers become more wary of spending on non-essentials like eating out. And next, Boeing is requiring many salaried workers to take unpaid leave to preserve cash as the troubled plane maker digs in for contract talks with its largest unions. Affected employees will work a rolling schedule of three weeks on the job and one week without work or pay. And finally, Microsoft is teaming up with a defense technology startup to improve combat, combat goggles for the U.S. Army. The goggles are based on virtual reality headsets, and they're intended to give soldiers everything from night vision capability to warnings of incoming airborne threats. Microsoft's earlier combat goggles left soldiers with headaches and nausea. And you can follow all the latest company buzz on T-R-E-N Go on your Bloomberg terminal mat. All right. Chanali, it looks like we're going to get a pop at the open today. Look at futures up 1.7% on the S&P, more than 2% on the NASDAQ and the Russell. The open is next. This is Bloomberg. Moments away from the start of trading on this post-Fed day, and it looks like we're going to get a big pop. This is Bloomberg Open Interest. I'm Matt Miller. Take a look at futures. Right now, 1.73% uh, is what we're looking at on the S&P 500. 100-point gain uh, It's indicated on the S&P. NASDAQ and Russell 2000 futures up even higher as it looks like those tech stocks and the smaller to mid-sized cap stocks would benefit more from this cut and possibly more cuts to come. Or, as Shanali has suggested, is it that the initial jobless claims number today cement the idea that we've had a soft landing. You can see the uh, opening bell being rung there on the New York Stock Exchange and here on the NASDAQ marketplace. And as we get into trading, we'll start and see those, start to see those gains ramp up. Of course, it takes a few minutes uh, sometimes to make a market in certain stocks, so you don't have all of them open right at the bell. But you can see that we already have these gains in the cash trade, 1.7% on the S&P, 57.12. That is a new all-time high for the S&P. And remember, we were already at an all-time high for um, the, uh, 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 the unweighted, the equal-weighted, sorry. Unweighted, what? I'm so excited. Same, same uh, thing. <laughs> you see the NASDAQ 100 uh, up more than 2% as uh, the Russell 2000 is as well. In terms of the stocks to watch, 
The big one, NVIDIA leading the way among the Magnificent Seven this morning, lifting major indexes as investors see the Fed's half point rate cut, helping chances of a soft landing, helping uh, the rising tide, which really rises all boats. And you've got some stocks too, right? Yeah, absolutely. I am pumped? pumped. It's a fascinating thing to watch the market hit new records after a decline actually yesterday, Matt, after that Fed decision. So let's take a look at some of the more movers here. Mobileye uh, up by 11.6%. This is after Intel says that it does not have plans to divest its 88% stake in the autonomous driving company. And we're also watching Darden Restaurants, another eye on the consumer here, even though it reported an earnings miss for the fiscal first quarter sales. Uh, it did say that things are improving. After July, it's up now 7.3%. It's the company behind chains like Olive Garden and Longhorn Steakhouse. Uh, shares are higher on the sales outlook and a partnership with Uber to bring on-demand delivery. Uber has been really striking those deals lately as well. Let's take a closer look at stocks moving following that big cut by the Federal Reserve with Bloomberg's Abigail Zulow. Yeah, this risk on rude mood is really pretty incredible. Uh, Chanel, take a look at NVIDIA which Matt was just looking at, but even higher than when he looked at it up more than 4%. Of course, this is one of the top three weightings to the S&P 500, the NASDAQ 100. And on the idea that more Fed liquidity is expected to be put into the system, that rising tide that Matt was talking about, really lifting all boats. But it's certainly these higher growth ones. Uh, it is worth noting, though, NVIDIA is still within a range. So we don't know that this stock is breaking out. Tesla higher, uh, Mara Holdings, one of the crypto stocks, up 5.4%. And then the green space is also up 3.7%. The travel space. Uh, again, most stocks are higher. Let's put it together with the Goldman Sachs most highly shorted tech uh, companies. And yes, as uh, not surprisingly, you can see that over the last three days, it is really four days. It is really popping. And here is this morning's pop up 3.8 percent, really not so shabby. Again, on the anticipation that this liquidity is going to support stocks and risk assets going higher. Finally, let's take a look at the volatility because there has been quite a bit of vol volatility. And this is interesting because we're taking a look at the VIX here and the VIX in. So this is over the last month. You can see the rising volatility today. Both of these indexes, or at least the VIX, uh, down a bit. But take a look also at the spread between these two indexes. Matt, it's interesting because Kevin Kelly of Kelly ETFs uh, not so long ago had mentioned that you always want to keep an eye on this spread because it does point to the idea that more volatility could be ahead tomorrow of course triple witching so watch out oh i'm excited for triple witching abigail thanks very much abigail do a little talking to us about the volatility there we're actually we have the perfect guest to follow on that amy Wu silverman joins us she's head of derivative strategy at rbc capital markets and we have seen elevated volatility even yesterday um uh, i think we saw the vix at 18 What's going on with that as everything else sort of gets normalized? You know, it's interesting. We were noodling on that as well. And I think the market's still taking its time trying to figure it out. It was interesting. We had a client dinner right before the Fed and we said, look, if we get 50, what do we think happens? And a lot of folks said we get a knee jerk reaction higher, but then we may sell off after that. So I think it's a little bit too early to tell. You know, you obviously get these initial reaction functions, but then people have more time to digest it. And I think it's a little too early to say if everything is great so far. I actually called the sell the news effect yesterday, to, 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 credit to my credit, that. right? <laughs> I didn't expect this kind of huge jump. Or, chanali has been pointing out, you know, the rise that we've seen in Treasury yields on the 10-year, 12 yep. basis points over the Very last well. three sessions. What is the market telling us? Is the market telling us there are more bigger rate cuts to come, or is the market telling us they've nailed the soft landing and we're good? Don't, I definitely don't think they've nailed it yet. I, I will tell you, coming into this, the positioning was interesting because from a how many people were long mag seven tech, positioning was already quite full. And then on top of that, what I look at, the derivatives, we're also telling you people were quite nervous. There was a lot more demand in hedging than we've seen in a really long time. That really started to inflect after that August 5th spike. Now, it's a little too early in the sense that the market's just opened. I think people will start to rejigger and reposition today, but I'm very interested to see if that sticky downside positioning in the options market stays or people say, just kidding, I'm not worried anymore. Let's take those hedges off. This is 
just an incredible move in the market the next day. And it does conflict with what we're seeing in the bond market, as we've been saying. It's like the bond market is telling you that they're worried about growth in the longer term, particularly when you see the move in the 10-year. But the stock market, the exuberance is wild. You see almost every major industry group up. We're at a new intraday record high to start the day. Which market is the right read? This is, this is I think, the age-old question now. If you look to history, it's typically that the bond market tends to be a little bit more thoughtful. Uh, the equity market tends to be a little bit more reactive, and oftentimes there's a catch-up from the equity side. I'm not saying that's always true, but historically, when you look at this relationship, uh, it's the equity market that eventually starts to digest, but it reacts and has that momentum first. So then how do you think about the setup now? We have more information. We have that first 50 basis point cut here. And whether or not you agree on whether we'll get 50 next or 25 next, is there a clear trade to be had now that we are, have begun this rate cutting cycle? Yeah, I, I would say two things. The first is no matter where you stand, the fact is the equity markets are at all time highs. So whether or not you think that means we'll have a drawdown or you don't, it's, it's a function of hedges have become attractive no matter what place you're in simply because you have more to protect. Does that make sense? Yeah. So for me, when you see volatility slowly trending up, but it's still relatively inexpensive on a longer term historical level, I think it makes a lot of sense to have those conversations about protection. So, you know, from a trade structure perspective, we're talking to clients who are in the boat of being happy with where they are this year, but also folks who aren't and are still concerned. And those structures are lining up right now for either of those camps. Well, we were talking with Greg Bottle from BNP, um, I think last week, and he said it used to be, you know, investors would buy the dip in equities, and now they buy the dip in vol. Um, is that going to continue here? I mean, it's cheap, right? Yeah, look, if you think about event risk, <clears throat> there's a lot. And event risk is typically what keeps the equity options market bid. And, you know, the next kind of scenario I point to, I think it's going to be really interesting, is you have the November 5th U.S. presidential election. Well, you have October 4th non-farm payrolls, right? Of right? course. Yeah. Oh, data, a huge data slew before that. And then two days after that, the Fed has to make a decision. And the scenario I've been playing around with clients is, look, what if it's a really close election? We don't know who the president is necessarily by November 5th, and the Fed has to go ahead and make a big decision. Like, how does one impact the other? Right, November 7th, actually, yeah. I, th I think, you know, yeah. politically, it could be quite interesting. And then volatility-wise, it'll keep those options bid. Well, the volatility is what I was wondering around here. Because getting into this moment, the volatility was very drastic on every data point really particularly in the bond market when you looked at everything that could influence rates but at this point do you expect the same velocity of movement with those data points heading into November or is it going to be the headlines is it going to be the election rhetoric that really starts to change sentiment you know it's what I found so fascinating is when you look at August 5th which is really the last big vol spike we had I think it really came out of the blue for people that, wait a minute, this one NFP is causing this level of dismay when everything else that caused that kind of move was like a 2008 crisis, right? So does data have the ability to do that? Absolutely. We've seen it in the recent history. But on top of that, I do think something we haven't really addressed at all because we've been so Fed focused is that geopolitical risks are really rising. You know, and it's been amazing at how the markets just managed to slough this off. But we have a serious escalating crisis in the Middle East that really I don't think is being priced in at all to the volatility surface. We have ongoing, you know, U.S. election volatility. And then on top of that, we have critical data points. So, yes, I think all those could continue to make you want to buy the dip, if you will, in volatility. Uh, to that end, gold is higher today as well. We're going to keep you uh, here with us. That is Amy Wu Silverman, of course, at RBC. Gold is fascinating. It I, is. I, I think gold is really interesting. We, we don't touch on it. Oh enough here, well, I think. Perhaps we'll talk about it next, about what, how to hedge and yeah. such. Now coming up, JP Morgan joins the bear camp on Five Below. Details and top calls on individual stocks next. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Open Interest. I'm Matt Miller. Quick check on the exuberance in the stock market here. S&P 500 
uh, up one and a half percent, 5,700. So once again, we have a new all time high on stocks. Um, were those rates restrictive? I guess they're not today. Intraday uh, NASDAQ trade up um, almost 500 points, right? 19,795. The Russell 2000 gaining one and two thirds percent at 2,243. So some big, big gains for equities after a 50 basis point cut by the Fed. Time now for the top calls. Some of our uh, analyst action uh, focus this morning. First up, JP Morgan says five below is a sell. The analyst sees softer third quarter sales figures and stronger headwinds for five below next year and that stock is down on a day when every other stock is rising. BTIG is next up upgrading DoorDash to a buy. The analyst says the food delivery company is reaching key milestones and the analyst there expects positive net income in the second half of the year at DoorDash. Finally, Barclays is initiating coverage of Hertz, the car rental company, with a sell rating. The analyst says the rating reflects questions around its liquidity as it undergoes a significant fleet overhaul. Remember, Shanali, they bought all of those Teslas, which turned out to be not a very good idea, and then they had to start selling them off. And we're going to talk about the broader markets back again with RBC Capital Markets Head of Derivative Strategy, Amy Wu Silverman. And, you know, we were just talking about the exuberance in the market this morning after we saw that 50 race, basis point rate cut. And I do feel like I'm that girl now bringing Advil to the party, right? <laughs> <laughs> just preventing tomorrow's hangover a little bit by asking you how worried are people about the valuation levels we're sitting at? And how are they hedging for any downturn? What if this move isn't real. Yeah, I, I do think people are asking that question. Frankly, I think people are still skeptical right now. You know, we'll, we'll almost see how today shakes out. But, you know, three trades we've talked about a lot. The first is something really simple, like an S&P put spread. So you're just protecting downside in a range. We know volatility has picked up, but it's still relatively inexpensive. VIX is one. Obviously, headline VIX has come in a lot. It's coming in today, but VIX call spreads are another one. And then finally, I would say these big single names that carry so much weight, your NVIDIAs of the world, yes, you've done great on it, but because you've done great, perhaps it's an opportunity to protect that greatness that you've already accomplished. What is your thought on gold? Janali was talking about the rise today, getting back towards an all-time high. I think it hit one yesterday in the, in the wake of the Fed, and it's up 25% or so year to date. Is that a good hedge? Yeah, well, you know. They're is it too conventional for an options person to just go out and buy a shiny metal? You know what options, uh, I'll tell you what options folks do. Do they look at GDX and they look at GLD, the two ETFs that are related to it, and they buy call spreads on them. And because, as you said, gold has been ripping, what actually happens is that upside, that call upside wing gets so big that something like a call spread essentially gives you very high payouts. And so options people always think about the world in terms of what are the odds I'm getting, right? I put a dollar in. I want at least $10 out if this trade works. And that's how we think about the trade in gold for derivatives. What are you seeing in terms of how clients are hedging right now? Are they flocking to hedges by any means? I'm wondering if there's some significant caution under the surface of this rally. Yeah, I'll, I'll give you two interesting data points. So everyone tends to look at VIX headline, right? And if you look at VIX headline, it's selling off right now. It's back in the teens. It would tell you everything's fine, but look, the plane's altitude has stabilized, but folks remember the turbulence from a few months ago, so their seatbelts are still buckled. And we see that in these secondary metrics. We see that in SKU, so the demand for hedges, and we see that in the volatility of VIX itself. I always find that to be a little bit of a, a brain cramp, but the volatility of VIX, the VVIX, is still quite sticky, and it's telling you that underneath the surface, People are still worried. Yes, this is great, but they're not getting rid of their hedges quite yet. You're just saying that it... Uh it hurts you to think about it, to be nice to us. Because you <laughs> totally are comfortable with thinking about it. I wanted to ask about bond, bond market volatility. We had Gabriela Santos on from JP Morgan the other day, and she was, her note, um, her most recent note was called, um, I think, Normalization Nation, right? Okay. Because everything's normalizing is the idea when you look at the labor market, when you look at rates um, and growth. But the bond market volatility is not normalizing. Why do you think that is? Yeah, look, and I think this speaks to what we had been talking about earlier, which is the, nerve in a, the nervousness you see in one versus the nervousness you see in the other. And, you know, eventually somebody has to be right. And I do think when you look at equity markets, when you look at reactions, 
equity markets tend to be more knee-jerk, first of all, and they tend to be more momentum-driven. So one uh, ratio we like to track is just simply move to VIX, and that just gives you treasury vol relative to equity volatility. And if we start to see that peak a lot in favor of rates volatility, usually that means VIX volatility does need to catch up. So we're going to be watching that ratio. I want to talk about an area where there's some positive momentum. The small cap index, Russell 2000 today, gaining more than the S&P 500 at the moment. How much optimism is there across the street for small caps now that we're seeing these rate cuts? So I'll tell you, the trade that's been occurring for a while, this is even prior to the 50 basis points, was folks have been owning IWM call spread. So IWM being a proxy for your value small cap trade and call spreads essentially saying, I want a high payout leveraged upside trade. To me, this is an upside hedge on the market. So if we're actually in this wonderful scenario, everything is good, historically that means everyone's going into this widening breadth trade. Now, most folks, I will tell you, are still in the MAG7, but they need to sit on something that works if the rotation happens very quickly. So we're seeing an IWM call spreads. Watch those small caps. Yeah. Too bad Katie's not here. And uh, <laughs> it's great having you on. I learned so much here. when you join us, honestly. So it's really cool that you can explain it to even a numbskull like me. Amy Wu <laughs> Silverman there, RBC Capital, head of derivatives strategy. Coming up, Prospect Capital gets a negative rating outlook by S&P Global, citing one of the private credit firm's most used debt strategies. That's next in our wall. Street Beat, this is Bloomberg. And it's time now for the Wall Street Beat. S&P Global has revised its rating outlook for an $8 billion private credit fund, Prospect Capital, to negative, citing frequent use of payment-in-kind arrangements. Of course, these PIC payments have become very popular on Wall Street lately. Prospect saw $417 million in realized losses for the year ending June 30th. Let's discuss this with Bloomberg Sridhar Natarajan. This story, if you've been watching it closely, has been pretty interesting. But let's just talk about the wider ramifications applications quickly. Some of those losses tied to a single investment which filed for bankruptcy. We're seeing more bankruptcies. Is private credit uh, in more trouble than it seems right now based on what we see with Prospect? And you're absolutely right. We need to zoom out. Private credit went from an area of interest to hype to hysteria. Now the question is, does that hysteria tip over into greed and therefore generate bad outcomes? That is the real concern here. And that is why when we see developments with funds like Prospect, that's where we want to zoom into and see where the real problems exist. Because a lot of these funds are now funding middle America, the middle si mid-sized companies, the smaller companies that banks are not lending to. Do we have enough of visibility into that space? And will that stay stable? steady if there is an adverse credit cycle. I was wondering if um, the Fed cutting rates will sort of tamp down some of that hysteria. But more importantly, I now want to know rate, right? it's what awkward. the hell is a payment in kind transaction? <laughs> Let's not just gloss that over as if everybody understands, because I don't think and why have they become so popular Anyone right besides now? you and Shanali gets it, right? It is a be beauty of financial engineering, right? You've gone through a phase where a lot of these companies have borrowed money. They have to pay regular interest on that debt. Now, sometimes they're not, they don't have that cash on hand. So the creditors tell them, fine, we will just add, make a payment in kind feature. You will add that interest to your ultimate principal due at the maturity of the loan. You don't have to pay cash right now. That's interesting. How does it affect someone like a prospect? Prospect, the way it's structured, this publicly traded credit fund, it has to distribute 90% or a majority of its income as dividends to shareholders. And payment in kind income is counted as income that has to be distributed to shareholders. But you don't get that cash. You're not getting that regular cash payment. So what do they do? They turn to the retail investors. They sell preferred shares. They sell so-called baby bonds raise cash from that and then pay that off to shareholders. Question is, is that a sustainable structure? Prospect says it has enough access to funding, nothing to worry about. But if you look at some of the recent events around the company, especially that fairly intriguing earnings call last month, you will at least sit up and take notice. I will read you these quotes one day from the earnings call. They were fascinating. Oh, I'm just glad I learned <laughs> what payment in kind is. Uh, we will have to explain it once again. Tree, we thank you so very much. Yeah, that, that was excellent. I'm learning so much today. Um, let's get to the trading diary. This is what you need to be watching. 
Is there really anything after the Fed meeting? Uh, logistics giant FedEx and home builder Lennar report results after the bell. Then the central bank spotlight turns to the Bank of Japan to the extent that you care. And just as traders come to grips with the Fed's cut, Friday's triple witching threatens to whipsaw the market some more, although it never really seems to do very much, does it? I uh, will see. It's been a volatile market under the surface. The VIX still elevated, even though everything else calming down, I guess. Oh, the VIX, watch out for that. Coming up next, Steve Eisman of the Big Short fame. He joins us to talk about the market risks that he's watching. Plus, Data Moran CEO talks about the risks her software analytics firm is identifying for blue chip customers. We are 30 minutes into a trading day on which stocks are ripping. This is Bloomberg Open Interest. I'm Matt Miller. And I'm Shanali Bassett. Katie Greifeld is off today, and we're waiting for more eco data to cross the terminal. We'll keep an eye out for those existing home sales. But Matt, first, let's get a check on the markets. Yeah, they are up right now. Here you can see uh, the S&P 500 up 1.5%, 5703, a new all-time record high. The Nasdaq also gaining two and two, uh, two tenths of one percent. The U.S. ten-year yield up right now, three basis points. And if you look over the last couple of days, it has really trended higher, about ten. We're getting existing home sales data, and they are sliding to the lowest level since October. They come in actually just below estimates to 3.86 million. The estimate was 3.9 million, so just shy of estimates. But it's interesting to see those sales slide because we have seen that mortgage rate also drop significantly, but right. uh, probably not enough to really invigorate this market. Well, it was 6.15 percent yesterday, and uh, the lowest level that we've seen in some time. Five handle, they say. You need a five handle to get. Yeah, yep. we heard that from Bess Friedman yesterday. Let's get some insight right now, though, on the Fed's move. We're joined by Steve Eisman, Eisman Group, a Newberger Berman Senior Portfolio, Portfolio Manager. And you don't seem terribly jazzed by this 50 basis point cut. Um, it doesn't really rock <laughs> your world. You know, I'll, I'll, let me tell you about my day what, what, from a PM's perspective about what actually happened. So, you know, prior to Fed Day, I get 3,000 emails about what the Fed's going to do, and then the Fed does what it does, and I get, an e I get emails of uh, redlined. It's like every word that, that is changed is, is crossed out, every new word is put in. It's like, uh, it's like you know, they treat this like um, Moses coming down with the tablets, uh, you know, are the Ten Commandments are still in the same order that they were in. <laughs> and, um, but it's an important communication function because the Fed knows they treat it like the Ten Commandments, so th they take it seriously as well. But, you know, 25 basis points, 50 basis points, and every time the Fed does whatever it does, the market has absolutely no idea what to do the very first day. And then think about today. So the market's up a lot and rates are higher. Like, that shouldn't be. You know, if everybody's so, so into, like, what's the Fed going to do? Are rates going to go lower so the stock market went up? Well, rates are up and the stock market's up. So I, I think it's worth a lot more. It's much more important about how's the economy doing. And if the economy is fine, you could buy stocks. And if the economy is going to go into recession, you can't. The, the rest is, is gobbledygook. What do you think is going to happen, though, at this point, though? Because you think about what the bond market is doing, and it's showing you a different story. The exuberance in the stock market uh, is not being reflected in a bond market that seems to be more worried. That's who's, the point. Who's right? right? Yeah, but who's, I know the bond market right? is worried. The economy is okay. So why should, should long-term rates go down that much? Well, tell me this. You were looking at a market not only rallying to intraday records today. You're looking at a Philadelphia Semiconductor Index up almost 3.6% today. How are rates going to impact the AI story? They don't. So they don't impact what, what, it at all. What is the sense like of Like I said, trade? people just people spend a lot, of money, a lot of money and a lot of time trying to figure out what, what uh, God, excuse me, Powell's going to do. And... Um, <laughs> I, that was intentional, by the way. And um, I don't think it's... Look, if, if the Fed's raising rates very, very aggressively, that's important. And the Fed's get, cutting rates extremely aggressively, that's important. Everything in the middle, it, it's just not that important. It's better to focus on the economy. What, what, so what is your take on the economy? I mean, we saw a retail sales number the other day that I think was surprising. Um, if you 
you know, don't see that the U.S. consumer sort of beats expectations every single time, right? So um, the <laughs> economy is growing at like a 3% clip. Unemployment's at 4.2%, right? Inflation's back down to like 2.5%. Um, is everything good? Well, not everything is good. No, but you know, I mean, there, there has definitely been a slowing in the it economy. Was it a soft landing? Was it a soft landing? Well, the, the, there's been a slowing in the economy. Um, the lower end consumer is somewhat stressed. They're spending less, but you know, there has it, there's been an increase in delinquencies, but not terrible. So on the margin, things are a little bit slower, but inflation is cooler. So as far as I'm concerned, things are are fine. You know now. There are people out there who are going who are still saying there's a recession going to happen, you know, right around the corner, and maybe they're right. But as far as the, you know, the current data is concerned, I don't see that. This is like what uh, Ron Temple was telling us yesterday from Lazard that the 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 economy has gone from really strong to just strong. So if you have a strong economy, if you are not that worried about a recession, it seems, you have a S&P 500 at 50, above 5,700 right now. Where does it end next year? I mean, at this point, how much more growth is there to be had in equity prices? Yeah, I guess that's a question about valuation. Um, I, I don't generally get all that exercise about where the market valuation is. You know, one thing I learned in um, the dot-com bust was, you know, leading up to the dot-com bust, you know, a lot of commentary about how things are ridiculously expensive, and all that commentary went right out the window because it, it, nobody cared. When did they care? They cared when the economy really rolled over and the fundamentals of those companies rolled over. Then everybody said, oh my God, these things are ridiculously expensive. So, and as long as the economy is fine, I think the general direction of the stock market is up. How much? I have no but idea. But as long as the economy is fine, because we were talking about yesterday, again, the parallels between uh, maybe NVIDIA and a Cisco in 1999, right? As long as the economy is fine, um, that doesn't... Cisco broke when the economy broke. Right. And so, therefore, its fundamentals rolled over. You know, if the economy really broke, I'm sure NVIDIA's fundamentals would probably break, too, and, and, and we'd be having a different discussion. But as long as the economy is okay, it's a different story. So tell us about your portfolio then. You're not shorting anything, nope. right? You're long like 30 to 35 stocks. You've got your own little Dow Jones right. going there. Um, what, what, how's that portfolio the look? Eisman How do you construct index. it? Um, so Eisman Group, there are three of us. Um, it's me, my sister, and my brother-in-law. All uh, in the family. Nepotism. All in the family. And um, we get along pretty well, thank you. It's the name. <laughs> and um, we're, we've become fairly thematic. I mean, we have, we certainly have individual securities that we love, but, you know, the two dominant themes in the portfolio would be AI slash tech and everything kind of related to it, and um, infrastructure. Uh, we, we think those are the best stories, and, you know, one of the things that I've said in the past is that in good times, uh, people care about stories, and in bad times, I care about balance sheets, and we're in story time. But in, in the sake of that AI conversation here, too, I understand what you're saying about Cisco breaking with the economy and worries about that when it comes to NVIDIA in the future. Extreme situations. But what about valuations in the AI world? How long will it take to see more payout in uh, the investments being made? I actually think it's going to be longer than people think, which is actually good for NVIDIA because it means they got to sell a lot more chips. And, and one, of the, one, of the, one of the reasons why I think that is... Um, Accenture, the business that is doing poorly is their consulting business. But the business that's doing well is their outsourcing business. And the reason why the outsourcing business is doing well is that most companies, and we're not talking about the, the big you know, AI plays, but everybody else um, has hired Accenture basically to clean up their data. That their data that they have is in different places, it's not clean, and so whatever they want to do with AI, they're not even in a position to do it until the data is, is, is structured in a way that they can then do it. We're still in that stage. So until we get past that and then companies are going to start trying to figure out what, what they can actually do with AI, this, it's, a, it's early. You know, it's interesting. You came out of 2008, you came out of 2020, you came out of these big market moments, and you kind of redefine the narrative, right, in terms of how, what you thought would be the kind of cyclical trends over the next five, ten years or so. Now that we're in the beginning of this historic rate-cutting cycle, 
is this the AI economy? I mean, is this, you're seeing so many dollars. You see it in the trade today even. This is where the money is going. What does that mean in terms of how investors have to recalibrate the way that they put money? I don't have to recalibrate. Uh, like I said, good times is story time. Yeah. And, you know, where are there good stories? There are those big two. There are some others. You know, and an area where, where I think, for example, there isn't a great story is it just in traditional banks. You know, nothing against traditional banks. They're all well capitalized. They're fine. They, they, you know, they're safe. But can you construct a story that tells you that you really want to own banks? The only story that you could construct would be that Trump wins and the regulatory environment changes. And that would be good for a, a pop, but that's not a story. Now, I want to go there next because it's story time. It's good times, as you point out, but it's also storytelling time, as Joe Matthew often says on Balance of Power. We're going into an election, obviously, it's, I think, only seven weeks away, uh, and I want to get your take. Steve Eisman, Eisman Group, Newberger Berman, Senior Portfolio, portfolio Manager, is going to stay with us um, to talk politics. Right now, though, let's get a look at the stocks moving this hour. For that, we go to Abigail Doolittle. Abby? Well, let's talk food because we have the shares of Darden Restaurant popping up nearly 8%. This after the company reaffirmed its sales outlook. They also uh, inked a new partnership with Uber, Uber Delivery. So essentially, uh, they uh, said that sales have continued to improve since July, they have signaled that despite the fact that uh, there are cash-strapped consumers out there, they're getting the most, and they've been able to maintain the full-year guide. Turning to DoorDash, we have this stock also popping after BTIG upgraded the shares to a buy from a neutral signal. Checks, uh, channel checks are signaling that continued strength is there for DoorDash, and they're also saying that they're quote-unquote un underappreciated of uh, future drivers for DoorDash. And then finally, relative to the Fed risk rally, let's take a look at the tech space, which has been underperforming over the last couple of days on this rotation into value. But certainly today, that's not the case. Apple up 3.3%, Microsoft higher, Meta higher. And then NVIDIA, this is one of the big ones, but it's interesting, Chanel, because it is still stuck in a range. So despite the strength today, it's not popping out. It's going to be really interesting to see whether or not this Fed rally uh, continues on or if some of it was already priced in. Absolutely fascinating. And banks hire to finally everywhere you go, you see a little bit of love. Now, coming up, we're going to have more on the markets and the election with Steve Eisman next. This is Bloomberg. Let's get now to high interest to look at what's making headlines around the world. Israel's defense minister declared what he called a new phase in the war with regional Islamist groups. Israeli troops are being diverted to the Lebanese border, raising fears of a wider conflict following two waves of exploding devices, pagers and walkie-talkies, which killed 32 people in Lebanon and seriously injured thousands, including Iran's ambassador to the country, he was holding a Hezbollah pager, apparently. The U.S. and allied countries said that they had taken control of a network of 260,000 internet-connected cameras, routers, and other devices that the Chinese government was using to spy on government agencies, university corporations, and media organizations. Authorities said the cyber spies used the devices to hide their tracks when they breached government and industry institutions in America, in Taiwan, and elsewhere. And Democrats are hoping Oprah Winfrey's influence and popularity is going to send voters Kamala Harris's way. The billionaire media icon will join the Democratic presidential candidate in a live stream town hall in Michigan later today. That's with less than 50 days until the election in some states already distributing absentee and early ballots, early voting ballots this month. Shanali? We're going to stick with politics because Steve Eisman is still with us, senior portfolio manager at Eisman Group, Newberger Berman. You know, the last time you sat with here with us, you said with 100% certainty, it's rare to see 100% certainty of anything, but you said with 100% certainty that Trump would win the election. But the facts have changed, haven't they? Well, in my defense, uh, I made that prediction when somebody else was running for the Democrats. So my prediction was basically that Trump would beat Biden. Um, I don't know if you've noticed, but he's not running anymore. So I withdraw the prediction. Do you I, have think no, that I have will... absolutely no idea who's going to win. Okay, I was going to ask you, do you think that that means that Harris has a better shot then than Biden would have? Well, there's no question she has a better shot. You know, I think the election, like everybody else thinks, is a toss-up. A total toss-up. So 
it's interesting because we're in good times, right, economically. Um, at least we're not in bad times. And usually when you're in good times, the incumbent wins. I know she's not Biden, but she's part of that package, right? She's the incumbent vice president. Uh, why do you think Americans are so dissatisfied, or at least that dissatisfied with this administration? Oh, look, I think the big issues, and I'm not telling anybody who to vote for, um, you know, the big issues that people care about are inflation. Yes, it's come down, but it was bad. They care about the border, and that's been bad. That's gotten better, but they remember. Um, and, you know, that's, that's what I think people care about. And, and, that, and that hurts the administration. Well, when you think about the policies, and I think it's fair to ask about what you think about both of their policies, Trump and Harris at this point in time, because the economy is such a big part of this election. What do you make of what they're putting forward? Which plan would stimulate more growth? So I, I have a sort of a very almost simplistic view of, of the implications of the, of the election for the market. So if Harris wins but it's a divided Congress, the market's fine. And if Trump wins and it's, and oh, if Harris wins and it's a Democratic sweep, the market's going straight down. Um, I'll get back to why in a second. Terribly unlikely, though. Well, I don't know if it's unlikely or not, but I'm just saying that's what, what that happens. If, if Trump wins and it's divided government, the market goes up. If Trump wins and, it, and it's a sweep, the market goes up. So the only circumstances, I think, under which the market has trouble is a Democratic sweep. And that's because, you know, the, the Democrats are talking about raising taxes. And um, markets don't like that. That's and, very I mean, simple. The reason I say it's unlikely is that the Senate... There's so many Democratic seats in it's the Senate. It's extremely unlikely, Jeopardy. but, yeah. you know, given what's happened, it, it, I, I'm not willing to go out and make a prediction that that can happen. Fair. What I think is interesting, though, is that if it's a red sweep, um, you know, which could happen, it's more likely, uh, you think that the market goes up. Well, the market goes up because it'll assume that their taxes are going to get cut. Right. But what will happen, possible. what will actually happen, then we'll, then we'll see. Okay, I'm, okay. I'm, just making, I'm, just, if, I'm just saying initial reaction, that's what would happen. I was going to ask if Trump's policies over the longer term are inflationary. It seems like if you raise tariffs, you know, if you export 15 million workers. I, I understand you, that economists yeah. get incredibly exercised yeah. about the whole, um, you know, Trump tariff thing. But, you know, one thing I've learned is the economy is a lot more complicated than that. Um, you know, it's possible at the same time that the Chinese economy will be weak and therefore is exporting deflation globally. So, you know, how much of an impact on inflation tariffs will have, well, who knows? And, no, and, I, and you know what? Nobody else knows either. Extending the tax cuts or even looking at new ones with the deficit where it is today, how possible is that? And why would even Republicans vote to make that happen? Well, Republicans will do whatever Trump tells them to do. That's kind of how Republicans act. So I actually don't worry about the deficit. You still don't worry I about it. I still don't worry about it. You asked me though, last time, and I'm I'll tell sorry you again. I, I don't know about the, <laughs> the deficit. Way, right? Right. <laughs> Only the deficit. Yeah, okay. Um, but even though both parties seem to <clears throat> want to spend money um, you know without what? really finding I, Let me tell you why I don't worry about the deficit. Yeah. I mean, what would cause interest rates to go up a lot? because people really are concerned about the deficit as, well as, as opposed to getting on a show like this and pontificating about it. <clears throat> You got to understand that the entire global financial system uses treasuries. Banks, overnight repos, tri-party repos is all done through treasuries. Big money parks money in treasuries. You have an entire global financial system that relies on treasuries. For, for the deficit to really matter, you have to break that. Until then, people are just going to buy treasuries at one level or another. And what would break that? You need a substitute. What's the substitute? China? That's China bonds? That's not a substitute. Bitcoin? Please. European bonds? Not possible. So there's no sub until there is a substitute for treasuries. I don't worry are about the deficit. Are you buying treasuries? We park some money there, but but I'm not the global financial system. The global financial system lives and breathes, it's the blood of the financial system is treasuries. So, so people want to know what you're buying, obviously. People want to know what you own. Um, what is the most exciting investment play for you right now? When you I get up in the morning, is there something where you're in the shower, you're like, yes, I can't wait to get to work and put this to action? 
uh, we're pretty long term, so yeah. I, we're not putting m much more into action. I mean, it's, it's what I said, AI and infrastructure is, is, are the dominant themes that are, are gonna last for a long time. We asked you last time you were here about what you would be buying in the event of a Trump win because you came in with that kind of certainty. Mm -hmm. You gave us your Trump trade. What was it? It, it was banks, but just as a trade, just not as, as an trade. investment. Right. So now with the new view that you have, what is the Harris trade? The Harris trade would probably be something related to something like solar. You know, solar stocks have done, and this is just a trade, yeah. you know, solar stocks have, for various reasons, have done poorly over the last couple of years for some fundamental reasons. People worry about the politics. You know, when, when it was more certain that Trump was going to win, the stocks got obliterated. Um, but as a trade, if you thought that Harris was, would win, um, those stocks would probably get a very big pop. All right, cool. Great having you in the, in, the, in the building and on set with us on the show. Steve, thanks so much for joining us. Steve Eisman there of Eisman Group, Newberger Berman. Let's get now a check on the exuberance that we're watching in these stock markets right now after the big 50 basis point cut. The S&P 500 up one and two thirds percent, almost the NASDAQ up two and a half percent. So really ripping and Shanali, to Steve's point, we still see rates rising. It's incredible. It's less than it was this morning, but yes. you're still seeing, seeing the 10-year up by more than three basis points. And we saw them rise yesterday, too. All right, still ahead, Saudi Arabia teaming up with Top Golf Callaway for some new golf courses in the kingdom. Details on Social Climbers next. This is Bloomberg. Time now for Social Climbers. The company's making waves this morning. First up, Saudi Arabia teaming up with Top Golf Callaway to launch new golf facilities across the kingdom as it tries to bring out sports infrastructure and increase the popularity of the game locally. Golf Saudi plans to build three Top Golf venues by 2028. Next, Steelcase says that big corporate customers are ordering less office furniture as the company gives a third quarter revenue forecast that fell short of estimates. And finally, Amazon is raising the pay of its hourly warehouse workers by at least $1.50 an hour and adding Prime memberships to their benefits. The raise boosts the average base wage to over $22 an hour, and Amazon is the second largest private sector employer in the United States, trailing only Walmart. You can follow all the latest company buzz on T-R-E-N Go on your Bloomberg Terminal map. All right, let's get a quick check at what's going on in these markets. We are an hour into the session and we're ripping S&P 500 all new, all time record high, over 5,700 right now at 5,708, 5,709 if you round up. The NASDAQ at 19,843, um, up two and a half, more than two and a half percent right now. The Russell 2000 doing even better. Um, so we're, you know, everybody is uh, rising right now. Even treasury yields are rising so investors bonds are being sold investors are selling <laughs> off bonds exactly which is really interesting um and they were yesterday after the uh decision as well it's incredible you are seeing the philadelphia semiconductor index now up four percent on the day this rally just keeps going up. yeah it keeps going no matter where you look coming up companies are still keeping an eye on esg they have to there are regulations out there data moran helps them do that we'll speak to the co-founder mariella lacourt alma Data Moran models itself as the smart way to use ESG investing principles. The company uses tech to analyze the complex risks associated uh, and rewards associated with governance to help its clients navigate an increasingly complex world. Joining us to discuss is Data Moran co-founder CE and CEO, Mariella uh, LaCour Alma. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, I was talking to you yesterday about your company and you basically pointed out that this is like you get a team of consultants that guide you through you know 4,000 different regulations and directives using AI and it, I guess it makes the C-suite's job a little bit easier. That's right so we started Datamarin almost 10 years ago now um, really with this idea in mind how can we make uh, sustainability data speak to executives 
And the way to do that was to build a platform, an AI platform, that focuses on a very large risk and opportunity landscape, but is able to simplify that enough through using artificial intelligence. So we look at a wide variety of environmental so and social and corporate governance type topics, and we analyze those in the context of regulation, media, and also the competitive landscape. So for the executives, it becomes easier to understand where they should focus their time. And, and by the way, lest anyone think this is just a play on the popularity over the last two years of artificial intelligence, it isn't. You guys, um, as I understand it, I guess came up with the idea in Central Park 10 years ago. Tell us about that. That's right. So I was living in New York City at the time, and I met a guy who was on Wall Street and also a a former consultant in big data and AI, and the three of us got talking. I had this idea around, you know, how do we elevate sustainability into the boardroom because it doesn't have a place there now. Of course, today it's an entirely different story. Everyone's talking about it, but not everyone knows what to do. So the three of us got together, and with the, you know, the, 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 the financial background, the AI background, combined with my ESG and sustainability expertise, we got started and step by step it's like it evolved. peanut butter and chocolate. <laughs> it is. It works well together. But you know what's interesting about this is over that 10 years, that of course the compliance landscape around ESG reporting across continents has been a nightmare for most companies. How does AI make this easier, especially because you could presume that this would also save a lot of costs at the end of the day for these companies that need to report a lot of this to different governments? 100%. So I think where AI really comes into play is that it actually enables this analysis to be done fast and on a regular basis. So companies are all dabbling into where do we focus? And no one wants to be called out on greenwashing, right? And I think there's a risk. If you try to do too many sustainability topics a little bit, you actually end up not doing not much. So this is where AI can help you really understand what are the issues that are most important according to the regulatory landscape, the reputation landscape, but also where are my competitors going. And overall, we've seen a shift from, let's say, uh, transparency into um, focusing on what matters most and currently, and this is very much driven by the regulatory develop, uh, developments that are happening in the European Union is a focus on governance. So who is actually behind the sustainability strategy of a company? How can we trust this data? And are there targets in place that are realistic to achieve? I wanted to ask more about just that, because ESG is a very broad term. Yeah. Some of it is around environmental, but much of it is also social and governance, particularly governance issues. And here in the United States, ESG has been a very complicated term. It has gone uh, left, right, and center yeah. <laughs> for over the last couple of years. But those other parts of it, social governance in particular, have only really taken off. Do you find a difference in the way that people are starting to really uh, redefine their ESG initiatives and the data that they're looking for? There's a clear call upon business to define what ESG or sustainability means to them. So that is deciding also what not to focus on. So I think that's been the, the biggest driver for our software to become a governance software that enables decision makers, so C-suite, that are also reporting on this information to the board, to be able to explain themselves because these topics are new, right? This is a new um, risk and opportunity landscape that is out there now, and give them information and evidence on what matters from a legal standpoint, reputation standpoint, is exactly the information they need to confident, confidently choose the topics that matter most, but also say we're not doing that. It's interesting, even just tomorrow, we were talking about this before the show, the CFTC is finally, after many years, voting on its guidance for carbon offsets. So even in the United States, you are seeing large companies having to deal yep. with a very fast-changing landscape, Matt. Well, and uh, you bring up large companies. Whenever I am pitched um, a company, I always want to know, okay, who are their customers, you know, to see if, especially a startup is legit. And you have the biggest of companies. Um, I wrote a list of some of the, those that caught my eye. JP Morgan, Kraft Heinz, Decathlon, Philips, BSF, Deloitte. So you've got 200 clients, I think, in the US and Europe. It's also important, though, who's investing in a startup. And you've just gotten a vote of confidence in terms of your funding. Yeah, so we're incredibly pleased to announce that we've received the financing, Series C financing from Morgan Stanley Expansion Capital, $33 million. And really what this allows us to do is to double down on the strategy that we already have in place.
So 200 companies, it's just a start. Uh, so the plan is to go to execute on our date 1,000 plan. So get to 1,000 clients by 2028. And that's essentially doing more of what we've already tested and done. And of course, keeping an, a very open mind to what the market needs because it's a fast evolving space. It's an industry in its infancy. And of course, there's also the Gen AI uh, de developments that we are looking at as well on how to best leverage that for our capabilities. Well, importantly, you know, there's AI and then Gen AI. How does the Gen AI really change the game for you? Yeah, I think for us, Gen AI is another opportunity to see what can, can be leveraged from those developments, especially in the context context of making it easier, easier for executives to understand the data and the information that we present to them. So it's almost like you look at Gen AI as the opportunity to contextualize the information like a human would. And I think that makes it very exciting because there's very, very much a, a sustainability literacy and skills gap at the moment. So using technology to, to promote that, to enhance that, is another opportunity that we see. So you're a 10-year-old company now, and I know that you're in town because it's climate week, and you're going to uh, premiere a film. Uh, it's a documentary film at the Guggenheim. Tell us about it. Yeah, so on Tuesday, we are uh, premiering the second version of our docu-series, New Heroes of Sustainable Business. And the reason for us to uh, commence this docu-series is really that we wanted to highlight stories of corporate leaders, really the, the executives, that continue to promote sustainability for their companies because they see it as a competitive advantage. Even they see it as a, as a matter of survival. So that's the idea behind it. We have a beautiful uh, panel also lined up for the Guggenheim uh, on, on, on Tuesday. So very excited about being here at Climate Week and, and showcasing And it's it. not all just like solar panel makers, right? I mean, you're, no. uh, I think, focused on Philip Morris. Yeah, we have Philip Morris in there, and we have the CEO of Philip Morris essentially saying, uh, you know, tobacco is something that should belong in the museum. And I think during Climate Week, we see a lot of positive stories. We also see a lot of case studies. So our focus is to hear from existing industries that have, ch you know, their challenges, and also see how we can uh, help get them to think about this differently. And that is not by thinking about sustainability as a long list of things to complete. That's really about picking those one, two, three items and making sure you have an impact there. Mariella, we have to leave it there. That is Data Moran, co-founder and CEO, Mariella Lecor Alma. Now let's go to check on the markets with Bloomberg's Abigail Doolittle. Things are still ripping out there. They certainly are, Shanali. We have the S&P 500 up 1.8 percent. This is the best day going back to August 8th, having to do, of course, with the Fed cutting rates by 50 basis points and the idea that more liquidity is coming into the market. Again, though, it will be interesting. And I think that Amy Sue Wil uh, Silverman earlier this morning was saying, you know, that some clients were saying that they had expected a rally and then a sell-off. Let's see what happens here, because that can sometimes happen. It's not just the S&P 500, though. It's also big tech up 2.8 percent, the Nasdaq up 4.3 percent. Banks, as you mentioned earlier, up 2.6 percent. Small cap up 2 percent. So this rally is going far and wide. What I would say, if we were to really summarize it, growth, the rotation that we had seen into today had been value on top, growth uh, suffering a little bit. That's the opposite today. If we take a look at the Russell 2000 or the Russell 1000, I should say, growth index up 2.5 percent. That value index up, though, uh, 1 percent, but un underperforming by a good 1.5 percent. So uh, that rotation moderating a little bit today, Matt. All right. Really interesting uh, look. Abigail, thanks very much. Abigail Doolittle looking at the stocks uh, for us. It's not everything ripping at the same pace, right? There's a little bit, even though they're all up. They're all up, but it's interesting. You have a day when you have both semis and banks up quite meaningfully. I'm still fascinated by just how much. I know. I think Katie likes the Russell. I like the socks. I love watching the volatility behind it, especially when rate cuts, the rate reduction the last month has not mattered. Right. So that 50 basis point cut setting things off is pretty incredible. Yeah, I think it's very interesting indeed. Coming up, U.S. colleges are feeling the pinch, but the fiscal picture is just as challenging in the United Kingdom. King's College, Cambridge Provost Gillian Tett tells us how the financial model is changing. This is Bloomberg.
It is time now for our daily Wall Street Week conversation. Yesterday we heard about the fiscal challenges U.S. higher education institutions are facing. Well, the business model is similarly strained in the U.K. King's College Cambridge Provost Gillian Tett told Wall Street Week's David Weston that universities there are uh, what well, universities there are doing to meet their financial obligations. So what you are seeing is a number of um, universities in the UK, like Imperial, like London School of Economics, um, are doubling down on international students and getting to a point when a majority of their students are from international um, sources. And that helps them, if you like, balance the books. You've got other colleges like St Andrews, which have done an extraordinarily good job of essentially aligning their admission process and their teaching process with the American system to pull in US students. And that's essentially subsidizing local British students and in some cases continental European students as well. At Cambridge and Oxford, um, where, which I know best, um, there is a very strong aversion in many of the colleges and departments to accepting students from international backgrounds just in order to get the higher fee income. In fact, um, Cambridge prides itself on essentially being background blind. So there's no affirmative action, there's no legacy admissions, but there's also no deliberate attempt to admit international students to boost the income. Um, people are really admitted on their own competence and skills and merits. Um, and that's a position which is, you know, in some quarters controversial because everyone would like some more income, but it does help to maintain standards. And it's very much in tune with the core philosophy of a place like Cambridge and Oxford, which is, it's really about merit and above all else, a strict meritocracy. So it's a, a precious brand, Cambridge and Oxford, at least that's the way I perceive it. Could you, consistent with that brand, expand out to, to ancillary services? In the United States, some universities say, for example, we'll take executives in for shorter term programs for money. There are revenue sources. Are there things like that that might be open to a Cambridge or an Oxford? Well, one thing to explain is that within the constellation of Cambridge and different departments, we have different colleges, which are a bit like halls of residence, but actually the power tends to sit with the colleges because they're the ones who admit the students and do half the teaching. So it's a very strange system compared to America. And the college that I oversee, King's College, um, has the luxury of having very beautiful buildings, very famous chapel, um, and we get a lot of tourists. And so we use a tourist income to boost our revenues. We also do a lot of conferences and we do events like weddings and things like that. And all of that helps. Separately, we have a business school at Cambridge, which is doing executive MBA programs and things like that. And so, yes, all of the colleges, um, all of the universities in the UK are looking for alternative sources of income. But then the question comes, is that impinging on the educational um, platform and the mandate and mission? Um, is it disadvantaging students? Is it getting in the way of the fundamental point of research and learning um, or not? Um, as it happens, we spend a lot of time at King's College in Cambridge because we do have this stunningly beautiful chapel, this astonishingly high number of visitors that come each year. We spend a lot of time thinking about how we can handle that without having the students feeling like they live in some kind of Disney museum. Um, that's a challenge. But frankly, every higher education institution right now is grappling with these challenges. And I can't stress strongly enough this point about legacy, which is that most Americans assume that elite universities have legacy emissions, meaning their wealthy donors give money on the tacit understanding that their kids or other kids will get to the head of the queue when they apply. Um, and that's taken as normal in the US. In a place like the UK, it is an absolute anathema. It's regarded as morally repugnant. And so there is no legacy admission in a place like Cambridge which is great for standards and, if you like, moral purity and a sense of meritocracy and fairness. It also, of course, means that we don't get the same donations as a place like Harvard or Stanford. That was King's College Cambridge Provost Julian Tett talking to David Weston. He joins us now to tell us more about uh, that. And it's interesting to see that the UK has similar challenges in terms of uh, higher education institutions than the US because, of course, um, at least in the U.S., they charge a ton of money to go to college, and in the U.K., it's not the same. In part because they can't. 
Yeah. As you know, there's a statute that essentially limits to about 9,000 pounds a year the tuition that British people pay to places like Oxford and Cambridge. They can charge foreign students more, but it's 9,000 pounds, which they think is a lot of money. We would think, boy, that is an amazing deal. Well, it's interesting. Is there something to be learned from their model here? Because when you talk to Jillian Tett here, it was this idea of other ways to bring in revenue to these colleges. Uh, do you find that colleges here are doing the same? Yeah, it definitely are. And particularly, by the way, online. I mean, there's been such a dramatic expansion of online, all sorts of things. In, in the piece that we do this Friday, we talked to the head of ASU, Arizona State University. They've got a huge online program that brings in a fair amount of revenue. So they are expanding out without a doubt. Uh, at the same time, most campuses, I would say, are not going to be able to bring in tourism dollars like Disney, <laughs> unlike, <laughs> unlike Cambridge. You know, so, by the way, one of the weddings that they did was Jillian's in July. I don't know if you saw in the New York Times, they had photos. It was gorgeous. Nice. It, it, I wonder if they're dealing with the same problems in terms of um, uh, building a, an ethnic, ethnically diverse class. You know, here in the U.S., obviously, after the Supreme Court decision, it's been made more difficult. Some colleges have been successful at it. I think Yale was good. Some have been less successful. I think MIT was having problems. How do they deal with that? Well, it's interesting. I'm glad you asked that question because I, I talked to Jillian about that because there's a perception, at least I had a perception, that it's basically elitist white males that go to Cambridge and Oxford. She said, actually, it's absolutely false that because they're driven strictly by merit, as you heard her say more than once, that in fact, they have a pretty diverse population socioeconomically as well as in terms of race and ethnicity. That's what she says. And still trying to broaden even more. Our thank you to Wall Street Week host David Weston and more on the new Wall Street Week this Friday at 6 p.m. New York time. This is Bloomberg. to the trading diary what you need to be watching for the rest of the week logistics giant fedex and home builder lenar report results today after the bell then the central bank spotlight turns to the bank of japan and just as traders come to grips with the fed's cut friday's triple witching threatens to whipsaw the market some more matt i'm going to go ahead and make a prediction on triple witching tell me that not much of a whipsaw all right maybe not i always get super excited <laughs> for these expirations right we build up to them and then like at one o'clock there's a little bit of a move can but... we talk about what is moving because this yes. market is going crazy <laughs> yes uh it, it's true i mean we're seeing gains on all of the equity indexes as shanali points out uh, massive gains on the Sox index which is of course philadelphia semiconductor index um, we're seeing big gains in the smaller caps in the russell um, but here the main index as you can see the s p 500 up one and a half percent another new all-time high a record high at 5706 uh intraday it would be a high obviously a closing uh, at closing levels as well the nasdaq up uh two and a half percent more than that 19,844 and the 10-year yield you know it had been up more but now it's I mean, one and a half. I want to look points. at the days trading so far in the bond market also, but because the two year yield also, you're actually seeing it lower on the day. You are seeing a little bit of bid in the bond market after that rate cut. You're seeing the two year 358. But flip up the board once more, check out this movement. That 10 year was up almost seven basis points we were talking about a little earlier today. Now it's only up one basis point, more than that, almost two basis points now. You've got to wonder if we look at this at the end of the day and people are buying the 10 year instead. So buying all around somehow, it's a strange trade. As yeah. uh, we've been hearing from Amy Wu Silverman, there's caution under this market, even at all-time highs. Yeah, ex I was just going to point out, you know, when you see uh, gains like this, and people who don't maybe pay attention to the stock market every minute of the day, as we do, I think there is a tendency to take profits um, at the end of the session as well. Some people may uh, hear, oh, new all-time high perk up and either sell their stocks or buy protection or you know sell puts whatever they want to do in order to hedge against a drop because we're at pretty high levels even though we're not yet at the 6,000 that for example Julian Emanuel at ISI forecast. There's been an, a lot of intraday volatility here so it is definitely worth keeping an eye on. We have a strong bid in this market but even that Russell 2000 people were so excited about these small caps coming into this morning. They are not as high as they were when we started the trade. The Sox has been 
flirting with 4% higher all day. It's hard to see us being down on the day from here, but it is only one day's trade. There are a lot of people starting to recalibrate how they feel about this market yep, after yep. 50 basis points. Oh, recalibrate. And, I like the way you work oh, that in. Thank you. Yes. Why? Yeah, because that's what <laughs> the idea was. Jay Powell was recalibrating the rates yesterday. That was the whole thing. I feel like we'll be recalibrating through 2025, don't yes. you? Yes. Yeah, well, we'll continue to calibrate for sure uh, right here on Open Interest. Tomorrow, our guest lineup includes Solita Marcelli of UBS Global Wealth Management and Barry Knapp of Ironsides Macroeconomics comes in from Vail. This is Bloomberg.